much for coming. I'm thrilled to be talking to you about this topic and very honored to be here. Um, as you said, my name is Rosemary. I'm a fourth year medical student. I'm going to be starting residency in pediatrics this summer. Um, Where are you going? Columbia. Yes, so I cannot wait. You're all welcome in New York anytime. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking specifically about my experience at one particular hospital in Brazil. It's called Bejetos Cancer Hospital, and we'll talk all about where the hospital is and the work that we do. So this is our agenda. I'm going to give a very, very, very brief overview of cancer in Brazil. You all are much more experts on global cancer than I am, but just to give you a little bit of information about um, what's going on there. And then we're going to go over um, how they're treating pediatric cancer at Bajados Cancer Hospital. And then I'm going to tell you a little more about my perspective on the hospital and why I really do think it lives up to its name as the Hospital of Love. Um, and we'll go through some of the other offerings that the hospital has and ways to collaborate and uh, work with their hospital. So just a few, um, go over a few brief stats about pediatric cancer in Brazil. The mean incidence rate of cancer there in children um, birth to 18 years old is 154.3 um, cases per million. There is an estimated 9,386 new cases of cancer in children in 2010. The most common cancer types similar to here are leukemia, lymphoma, and central nervous system tumors. And one thing I wanted to point out, a pointer, is um, they have a special mutation in Brazil. It's a P53 mutation that's actually called the Brazil mutation. And because of that, there is a higher incidence of certain types of cancers. So children who have the Brazil mutation are 10 times more likely to have adrenal cortical tumors. Um, and I definitely saw that clinically while I was there. I saw a number of infants just in my short month there um, who had uh, virilization and adrenal cortical tumors and um, some pretty interesting pathology that we don't always see here. Um, and also because of that, have an increased incidence of leaf from body syndrome. So um, when looking at access to care in Brazil, they have a um, national health care system called the Sistema Unico de Saúde. Um, or SUS, and it's part of their constitution that health care is guaranteed as a human right. So about 70% of the population accesses their health care through this system. The other 30% of the population are um, wealthy enough to have private health care as well. Um, geographically in Brazil, it's a huge country, and there is a lot of inequality in terms of access to health care depending on where you live. And these charts might be a little bit hard to see, but um, they look at basically different statistics based on region. So this first one, for instance, is cancer mortality rate per million. And this middle line is the median for Brazil. And these are the different regions of Brazil. And you can see that the north and northeastern regions are well below the average compared to the south and southeastern regions. And that is the case for all of these statistics. This one is um, oncologic surgeries per million, chemotherapy per million, and radiotherapy per million. Um, so there definitely is a lot more access to care in the South versus the North. Um, one thing I did want to point out is that my experience at Bajetas was very unique. It is an absolutely beautiful hospital that is doing amazing work. Um, and when I spoke to a lot of the doctors there, unfortunately, uh, they communicated to me that this was not the way that healthcare was in the rest of Brazil. It's very common there for hospitals to run out of com very common drugs. Um, they can sometimes have physical problems in the hospitals, like leaks or flooding in patient rooms. So this hospital really does represent an oasis of care for Brazil, and people come from all over Brazil and all over South America to seek treatment there. Um, so talking about the hospital, I'm going to start with the children's hospital. This is where I spent my month doing my rotation. This is a picture of the outside. Um, they have their main cancer hospital as well as another a number of other buildings I'll show you. This specifically is a children's hospital. It's a 26 bed tertiary care center, and it also has a palliative care center included in it. So this is where Bahetas is, just to orient you. So here is Brazil, and this is the state of Sao Paulo here, and this is a zoomed in version. This is the capital, Sao Paulo, and here is Bahetas. And just to point out again, um, it's a small community, it's surrounded by farmland, and really the hospital is the mainstay of the community there. The doctors all move there to work at the hospital. The patients go there to get treatment at this hospital. Um, it's a really special place, and the hospital is the main 
drop. The other thing they're very famous for is they have a very famous rodeo, if you are ever in Memphis <laughs> in August. Um, so one of the things that makes the hospital so special is their philosophy, and these are the three bullets that um, they gave me to share with you all. Their first is to care for underserved populations, and that is true. A very unique thing about the cancer hospital there is that all treatment is completely free. Um, it doesn't matter where, if they are from Brazil or if they are from another country, regardless of their country of origin, their care is completely free. Um, and they also provide not only care for the patient for free, but they also provide meals for their family members. Um, it is a full support network for um, these patients and their families. It's absolutely unbelievable to see. Um, their second point of their philosophy is to humanize healthcare which I also will speak a little more about, is definitely true. They take a very holistic look at patient care and the needs of the patient and their family members while they're there. And also to provide a care environment with full-time dedicated physicians earning equal pay. Um, and this statement kind of surprised me when I first saw it because I didn't know enough about how healthcare works in Brazil. But it's actually not uncommon for physicians to both work in a hospital and have a private practice. And sometimes, um, the work that they do is much more lucrative in their private practice than at the hospital. It's not uncommon for the government to hire um, a particular physician, let's say at a primary care clinic, and then they'll never be there because they'll always be at their, um, primary, their private clinic. So this hospital is dedicated really not only to the patient experience, but also to the physician experience and making sure that all the physicians there are full-time paid physicians who are being rewarded for the work that they're doing. Um, oh, my graphics kind of disappeared. Oh, I didn't know it's this. Okay. Um, so this is just to show you where the patients come from within Brazil to the hospital. As you can see, they come really from all over the country, the most being from Sao Paulo, but um, they have a very diverse patient group who are there. This is the number of cases that they've seen at their hospital. As you can see, it's risen dramatically. Um, the line in blue is the number of new cases per year, and the line in red is the number that turned out to be malignant. So in 2014, which is the most recent year of data that they had, they had 458 new cases, 232 of which turned out to be malignant. <coughs> As you can see, they've had a dramatic <coughs> rise in the number of cases that <coughs> growing. And unfortunately, they sometimes um, have a lot of patients who seek their care for other services as well that they have to turn away. For example, um, they are the only hospital that provides genetic counseling for free. Um, and a lot of people come to them seeking genetic counseling. And they had to instate a rule that only if you were already receiving care at the hospital for uh, cancer could you receive their genetic counseling. So they're in very high demand. Um, this is just a closer look at the number of cases by the last few years, and you can see that um, not only has the number grown, but they've also added in some new services. So in 2013, they started doing um, bone marrow transplants. Yes, bone marrow transplants, and that number grew from seven in 2013 to 17 in 2014. And they actually, um, they, they had such a demand to do these bone marrow transplants that they had to um, convert uh, normal patient rooms into bone marrow transplant rooms to do that. Um, and it apparently is a challenge to find donors there because it is such a diverse country, it can be a challenge to find donors um, for that procedure. This is just looking at the types of cancers that they treat. Um, by year, you can see that um, kind of aligning with the rest of the country, CNS tumors and ALL are the most common, um, but they treat a variety of cancers. There. Okay, so now I'm going to just talk a little bit about why I thought the hospital was so special. I love that its actual name is Verdas Cancer Hospital, the Hospital of Love, um, which tells you something about its philosophy. So the first thing I want to point out um, is the team. Uh, they have probably the most cohesive team and true team spirit that I've ever experienced. Um, like I said, all of the doctors are there because they want to be there, and there is a very cohesive spirit from the top down to the founder of the hospital all the way down. Everybody knows each other there. Everybody works together. Um, they have team meetings uh, twice a week 
whereas an entire team, all the doctors, all the nurses, all the nutritionists, all the physical therapists actually meet and discuss the patient's cases. Um, they can be long meetings, but it definitely says something about the spirit of the hospital and how collaborative it is. Um, and just going along with that, these were sl um, some slides, these numbers that the hospital director, Dr. Luis, provided to me. And he is counting every nurse, every nutritionist, every pharmacist, down to the social workers, all the way down to their two clowns. They also <laughs> view as the important members of the team. Um, yes, they also do, it's not on here, but they also do have what we would call child life specialists. They have a playroom um, in the lobby of the hospital that's open to all of the patients and their siblings while they're waiting for their outpatient appointments. And then on the inpatient ward, they have a separate playroom there as well. And they do have what I would call child life specialists who are there to assist the children when they're playing. They also have, this is amazing to me, a video game room um, for adolescents and they have someone in the video game room at all time to help kids like choose what video game to play and help them with the game. And they also have a, a family room and a space for families as well. Um, so this is what really struck me about the hospital as well. The entire construction of the hospital seemed to be built incredibly thoughtfully around healing spaces for children and families. And this is an example of one of the patient rooms. There's a couple features I want to point out. Um, you can't see it in this picture, but above every patient bed, they have a TV installed that they project images of the sky or flowers or cartoons, um, which when a child is stuck inside a hospital bed, you know, for however many days or weeks, that is an amazing feature. It also has a full couch here with a pull-out bed for family members, plus a TV, and then this is one of the outdoor spaces connected to their room so that family members can get some fresh air when they're staying with their loved ones. I was blown away by this. I had never seen a patient room that looked like this before. Um, and this is not unusual for this children's hospital. This is what the rooms actually look like. So these are just some of the other spaces <coughs> that I was telling you about that were um, so special to me. This is actually the hospital lobby. When you walk in, this is what you see. And um, this is like where you check in. This is outpatient clinics. And kind of to the back, they have a cafeteria service where um, families and patients, if they're waiting for an outpatient clinic, can actually get a meal on the hospital while they're waiting. Uh, this is the playroom on the inpatient ward. This is um, a picture of their day hospital. And this is the movie theater that they have um, for the kids. Um, the other thing that really struck me about this hospital is their collaborative spirit. And this slide could have had a number of titles. It could be international partnerships. But I chose collaborative spirit because um, they really are seeking to provide the best care possible to the children that they care for. And one of the strategies they believe to do that is to learn from other institutions and also have other institutions learn from them. So they have partnerships with MD Anderson and St. Jude's in the United States, NCI, as well as a number of international um, partnerships. The way that I saw this lived out, one with St. Jude's, at least at the Children's Hospital, is that they, a lot of the doctors from the house will travel to St. Jude's to do a rotation there, to do research there, um, and are very involved with um, St. Jude's Hospital. The other way I saw that this collaboration play out, both with MD Anderson and St. Jude's, was in terms of learning conferences. Um, so a number of times a week, they would have video conferences. Um, well, once a week with St. Jude's, and then another time with MD Anderson, um, to discuss difficult cases, I saw one with MD Anderson where all the nutritionists from MD, not all the nutritionists, but a few nutritionists from MD Anderson had a video conference with nutritionists from both the adult and children's hospital um, to discuss strategies of nutrition with palliative care patients. Um, they also do collaborative conferences with other hospitals in Brazil. So um, twice a week they have a call with other cancer hospitals throughout Brazil where they will bring a difficult case to the table and seek each other's opinions. Um, so this was Again, very collaborative. Um, I was very impressed by the entire approach that they took to education and, and patient care there. Um, so I was focusing on the children's hospital. I'd like to show you a little more of other parts of the hospital as well. So this was, um, they have an entire building that is specifically for palliative care. And this building is actually the original um, building that the hospital was founded in all the way in 1967. Um, and I should note, the hospital was founded by an individual um, 
who had a mission. He wanted to help provide care to this more rural, underserved area, since at the time you would need to travel to Sao Paulo to get um, world-class cancer care, and he wanted to bring it back to his community. And his family was really the one who took on um, maintaining and building this hospital. And the, the same family that founded the hospital is still involved in running it today. Um, so that original hospital is now a palliative care hospital. They also have a building on prevention and molecular oncology that um, is also the site of a lot of research. Um, and those of you who know Dr. Laura Musselwhite, she is how I found out about this site and guided me through the process of going to Pajero. She was my roommate while I was there. Um, this is where her office is housed and where a lot of research occurs. They also have a surgical training center. They train surgeons from all over Brazil and um, South America in laparoscopic surgical procedures. Uh, they have a clinic for non-malignant disease. And they also have a school of medicine with 300 medical students. And a lot of the faculty at the hospital are involved with teaching medical students as well. I rotated with a few of them, so that was fun for me to meet the Brazilian medical students. They also have um, another site, they have several sites actually, this is a picture of one of them throughout Brazil, that primarily exists for screening purposes um, and to direct patients to Bajados if they do need treatment. And one of the hallmarks of the hospital is they have one of the largest screening programs in the world for cancer, and they actually have these mobile units, they have 10 of them, that can travel to remote parts of the Amazon, remote parts of Brazil, and provide um, screening protocols and also even basic procedures. So this is an example of what one looks like. Here is some of the trucks on the move. Um, you can see men waiting, this is for prostate screening. This was, they can do actually, I think, mammograms on the truck. Um, so over 60,000 mammograms per year. Pretty impressive. I would have loved the opportunity to go, but maybe if I go back or one of you go back, you can go on one of the mobile units and provide some of the screening. Um, and briefly, I wanted to mention how the hospital is funded. I mentioned that it was founded by a family, and this family is the one who largely <coughs> Um, sustain the financial model for the hospital. The hospital now, it really is a community effort. Um, every year there are a number of pop stars who come together for a benefit concert to benefit the hospital. They also have these um, like penny jars that you'll see in restaurants and grocery stores where people can donate. And they also have a model where you can donate your um, sales receipt and then a portion of that is refunded by the government <laughs> towards the hospital. So it's a very unique model of providing funding for the hospital. All of the food is donated um, by local farms, grocery stores, food providers. And as I mentioned, Bajados is a farm area. There are a lot of farms. They also have partnership auctions to raise money for the hospital. And I should mention the famous rodeo that they have. The first day of the rodeo, all of the proceeds also go towards the hospital if you end up going to the rodeo. So I did want to spend a brief moment talking about some opportunities for collaboration, and this is really at the heart of the talk. They were so incredibly warm and welcoming to me. It um, really had an impact on me and made me want to similarly be welcoming to um, visiting scholars who come here to Duke. And they, um, in their spirit of collaboration, would love to have more collaboration with our institution. Um, so the first way to get involved is through research. They actually have an incredible research apparatus um, in Bajados. Laura is down there doing research right now. Um, they publish more than 150 peer-reviewed articles every year, conduct more than 100 studies annually. They have active research programs in a number of areas, and they have the infrastructure for clinical trials, primarily phase two and phase three. I should mention they also do have an electronic medical record and they also have a bio bank. Um, I believe it's over 150,000 samples of blood and tissue that is um, also growing for research purposes. Um, medical student clinical rotations are available. Um, I was there you know, from our institution. There was also a medical student there from Peru while I was there, um, as well as the Bajados medical students. And there are short-term research opportunities available both for undergraduate students, masters of global health students, um, or other professionals. And there are short-term scholarships available for research exchange 
I believe Laura can tell you more about those as well if you're interested. And also public health outreach. Um, their mobile <coughs> health units are amazing and they have a lot of outreach in the community and are doing a lot of work right now to improve primary care and improve uh, their public health efforts. I should say, especially now with what's going on with the Zika virus, this would be a very interesting and unique time to become involved. So if you are interested, as I mentioned, Laura has very kindly put herself out as a contact that if you are interested, you can reach out to her. Um, and Nelson Chow would also be another resource. So we're towards the end. I just wanted to give a couple of special thanks. Dr. Luis Fernando Lopez is the director of the Pediatric Cancer Hospital. Um, I cannot tell you enough what an amazing man he is. Everyone in that hospital knows him and respects him and loves him. Um, and he has a very special touch with the physicians who work there and with the patients. He's very passionate about what he does and um, is the one who really very thoughtfully designed every aspect of that hospital. Um, of course, uh, Dr. Muscle White, who guided me through this process, um, told me about this opportunity. Um, Dr. Chavez and Dr. Kramer were my clinical supervisors while I was there. They were both pediatric oncology surgeons, um, so I had to scrub into a number of surgeries while I was there as well, which was very interesting for me. And of course, um, the Duke University School of Medicine and the Dav Davison Travel Award that allowed me to travel to Brazil. So, Obrigada. Thank you. <laughs> long-term career-wise exactly what I want to do, but I would definitely like the head of us to um, be part of those plans. Yeah. I think once you go there, partly, I don't know if it's because it's so isolated and so the people who are there love it, but mm -hmm. it is a very special place. Before I went, Laura asked me, do you want to do um, pediatric cancer? And I said, I'm not sure, I just know peds. She said, well, you will after this. It's yeah. such a special place. And she was really right. The experience I got there was so holistic. Um, it was a very unique experience because being in clinic, being in the operating room, being part of you know, a multidisciplinary team, I got to see patients from the very beginning. Like one of um, the patients I mentioned who had an uh, adrenal cortical tumor. I saw her on her very first clinic day when she was first coming to the hospital. I then saw um, her in radiology. I got to watch all of her scans being done. Then I got to see her um, pre-op visit with the surgeon. I got to see her pre-anesthesiology visit with the anesthesiologist. I got to scrub into her surgery. I got to be with her after her surgery. And I got to see her at her post-op visit as well and recovering in the hospital. So getting to see that continuation of care from beginning to end was incredibly unique and something that I think as a medical student, I get more of probably than most clinicians, but um, definitely was a unique clinical experience. Where do their nurses and nutritionists and all of that come from? Um, a lot of them are a little more local from Bajados, um, but they are incredible. And at the Children's Hospital, they're all specialized in pediatrics. It's pediatric nutritionists, pediatric nurses. They do amazing work. Like just to give you an example with the palliative care patients, um, in the, hosp the pediatric hospital, in addition to the separate palliative care hospital, they also have special pal palliative care rooms in the hospital. And they actually have special like menus for them, and special cooks for them, um, so that they can eat you know special foods and enjoy. They have spaces for their families, um, so they do a lot of very um, cons very considerate and thoughtful things for the families and patients. Where do they get their training from? I'm not the sure. Structure of the nursing staff. Yeah, and that's actually a very good question that I don't know the answer to, but I would be happy to find out for you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much all for coming. I really appreciate your time and your attention during this. And these are, in case you were wondering, those are my sources. For this thank you.